So now we're going to turn our attention to a very interesting question. If we are always finding the average value of a continuous function, then must it be the case that there is an x value where if I was to plug that x into the function, that is, I actually found the y associated with this x, would there always be an x that would make my y equal to the average value? Well. I mean, if I take a look back at the previous examples that we did in the last video, I can see how this question at least can start to make sense. Notice in example two, my average y value that we found was pi over four. And so the question is, are there any x values in my interval, say negative one to one, that actually produce a y value of pi over four? And what we can see is, well, well definitely, right? Like notice, right here is a spot on the graph where I get a y value of pi over four, and so this is an x value that produces that y, produces the average value. However, there's actually also another one over here. So I could maybe call these x number one and x number two. Notice in the previous example, example one, we actually saw that, hey, right here on the function is where the average y value would, would be obtained. And so there is an x coordinate that I could plug into my function to produce my average y value which in this case was two and a half. So it seems like maybe intuitively, the answer to this would be yes. So I'll even write that here. It seems like this would be true, right? At least the previous examples seem to demonstrate this. So the previous examples do this. And if I was to think about it maybe even a little bit more, I could think even if I wasn't working with these examples, if I was saying that there was going to be some average y value that I was curious if my function ever crossed, if my function was continuous and started below it and then had to go up past it, wouldn't there automatically have to be a point, some x-coordinate, where my average function would be hit? So I could also say here that since f of x is continuous in this example, then it seems that it would have to cross the average y value somewhere, this seems at least reasonable. So the next theorem that we're going to have is actually going to kind of tighten the screws up on this idea and make it much more precise. It's actually what we call the mean value theorem, but for integrals. We had a mean value theorem for derivatives, but now we have a new one. Let's take a look at what it says. If I have a function that's continuous on a to b, then there definitely exists a number c. This is an x value inside that interval such that f of c is the average value. It's stating exactly what we asked above in the question here. But what's surprising is that this is stating that this, of course, works for any continuous function, not just for the couple of examples that we looked at, but for any function. And of course, that's a big statement, and so we'd have to be able to go ahead and justify it. So let's take a look. Let's see what we can actually state here if we knew that we had a continuous function. How could we guarantee that we were going to definitely um, have some x that could make the average y value pop out of our function? Well, I'll start by stating this. First off, since f of x is continuous on the interval from a to b, then I could definitely say by the extreme value theorem, which applies to continuous functions on closed intervals, f of x has an absolute max let's call it capital M, that's the, that's the biggest y value on the graph, and it also is going to have 
in absolute min, let's call that little m for the small value, and these have to occur on the interval from a to b, right? So we, we know this has to be true. This is what extreme value theorem tells us. If you have a continuous function on a closed interval, there's got to be a highest point, we'll call that capital M. There's got to be a lowest y value reached, we'll call that little m. So this means that if we were to think about the entire function on this interval, we would say that f of x, the function itself, is always smaller than or the same size as the biggest item, and bigger than or possibly equal to the smallest value, of course, on this specific interval. Okay, well here's all of a sudden where we can start to make use of some really interesting properties, specifically properties of integrals. Notice if our function is going to look like the following. If I have a function on the interval from a to b, and I know that it's a continuous function, right, maybe it looks something like this, and I know there's going to be a highest point, right, a highest y value reached, called that capital M, and a smallest y value reached, maybe down here, call that little m, then I can definitely say that the area underneath the blue curve should be the biggest area on a to b, the area underneath the green curve should be the smallest, and the area underneath our function f of x should be like middle sized. So I can state then that this implies that the integral from a to b of little m should be smaller than or the same size as the integral from a to b of our function f of x, which should be less than or equal to the area under the curve of capital M. This is just one of our properties of integrals. And of course, we can easily calculate this and simplify this down, or at least calculate the outer integrals. Remember that the area underneath M, capital M, is very easy because I'm just going to be creating a rectangle that is again m units tall, and it's going to be b minus a units um, long. So this is going to be capital M times b minus a. Whereas my green rectangle is just going to be little m units tall, and therefore it's still the same width b minus a, and I'm going to end up with little m times b minus a. But now I could see that since b minus a is a positive amount, I could divide everything through here by a b minus an a. Oops, forgot my dx there on my integral. Let me go back and put that in. Notice here if I divide everything through, I'm going to get, hmm, I get this integral, the area under the curve, times... 1 over b minus a, but wait, that is the average value. That means that my average value for my function is between the minimum and the maximum value. It's somewhere between them. But now I can start to see something. Wait a minute, if my average value then exists between where capital M is and where little m is, so let's say my average value is sitting right here, this is my average y, and I know that my function hits the maximum and it hits the minimum somewhere, then I can definitely state that it's going to be the case that since the function's continuous, I'll have to cross. If I have a continuous function and a point above and a point below, a y value that I want to hit, I have to cross over somewhere. And you might recall that this is going to be true by what we call the intermediate value theorem. So I can say then, by the intermediate value theorem, um, f of x must equal my average value for some value c in the interval from a to b. And so, there is 
of value C in A to B such that F of C does indeed equal my average value, which of course is the same thing as 1 over B minus A times the integral, which calculates the area under F of X. So this is it. This is the argument. There's got to be a time. As long as I have a continuous function, there's got to be a time when that average y value gets hit because the maximum of my function and the minimum of my function are below the are above and below the average value. And since the function's continuous, intermediate value theorem kicks in. So we'll see kind of how this applies to some different examples as we take a look at examples number three through five in the videos to come.